I've got to admit that I was, uh, you know, excited when I was invited, you know, to come to Norway. Because I've always wanted to learn more about, uh, you know, the aquaculture there on Atlantic salmon. The, you know, we were told, you know, a whole bunch of things that everything was ugly all the time. So when I was phoned and uh, asked to come to Norway, I said to myself, I am going to go. Because that's where it all started, eh? was in Norway. So I said, what a great opportunity to learn more about Atlantic fish farming. Norway has been at the leading edge of saltwater aquaculture since its early beginnings. And a visit to this country was seen by the Aboriginal Aquaculture Association as an excellent opportunity for First Nations from Canada to network with leading industry operators and researchers and to learn about emerging developments in aquaculture science and technology. The Aboriginal Aquaculture Association was established to promote the involvement of First Nations in aquaculture development and to encourage aquaculture advancement that supports First Nation communities, cultures and values. With this goal in mind, the Aboriginal Aquaculture Association, with the support of provincial and federal agencies, hosted a delegation of 13 representatives from 11 First Nations communities on a fact-finding tour to Norway. Over a 12-day period, delegates would have an opportunity to visit the world's largest aquaculture exhibition and tour a variety of industry-related facilities throughout Norway. Upon arrival in Norway, the tour's first stop was in Trondheim for the Aquanor International Trade Show. This year, there are prominent official delegations from many countries, like the chairman said, from Canada, this year's featured country, from Vietnam, from Germany, from the US, Australia, Scotland and Ireland. We welcome you all. And it's my hope that your days here at Aquanor will prove both fruitful and enjoyable. And to all of you, I hereby declare Agfa Nord 2005 officially opened. Aquanor is the largest aquaculture conference and trade show in the world, attracting over 15,000 participants from over 40 countries and over 400 exhibitors. Canada was the featured country this year, and more than 100 delegates from federal and provincial government, First Nations, academic institutions, and industry were in attendance. The Canadian pavilion included 12 official exhibitors and was a focal point of the trade show. Uh, we've, met, we've met a lot of different people from, um, I guess, all over the world that uh, that went to Aquanor and there's lots of uh, <clears throat> different equipment and uh, I've got lots of brochures and uh, that, that I can bring home. The, the booths, the displays were really interesting. We didn't get through them all but um, uh, I think the whole group combined might have seen most of it but uh, I think the the, the information we received there at Aquinor was really valuable and it changed my perspective in the, for the aquaculture industry. While Aquinor enabled delegates to gather a wealth of information about aquaculture, it also presented the opportunity to interact with government and industry officials from both Norway and Canada to form beneficial new contacts and relationships. In addition to networking with industry experts, exhibitors and public officials, members of the Canadian delegation presented several seminars to this international forum. Scientist and researcher Teresa Ryan of the Shimshan Nation presented one such seminar, which illustrated the leadership role First Nations must play in working with government and industry to support sustainable aquaculture. Bringing this to aquaculture and what this means for us as First Nations people and um, BC in particular, and in my area specifically, is that we have something to contribute to the larger picture and what goes on in our territories and with the resources. We can help identify... While attending Aquanor, the delegates also had an opportunity to meet with Marius Holm, the research and program manager for the Norwegian environmental group, Bologna Foundation. While much of the meeting consisted of the sharing of concerns and ideas about the environment, 
Mr. Holm was quick to point out numerous positive advances his foundation had realized with the aquaculture industry. Mr. Holm encouraged local communities to work together with industry and responsible NGOs to acknowledge problem areas and concerns and to disregard extreme groups that would never change their opinion on aquaculture. It seemed to be so refreshing to be able to uh, sit in the same room and discuss the, uh, the, the environment and uh, aquaculture between our, ourselves and, and him. And, uh, it, they're, they being so positive and being able to work with industry, you know, and it is really refreshing to, to be able to do that without um, all the other rhetoric that uh, we're, we're usually faced with, with the, with the environmental group uh, at, back in Canada. You are uh, people in Norway, and I'm, I I'm, would guess people in British Columbia too, are very well aware that we live we make a living in the world from harvesting various resources from nature. So we have a very uh, we have a very open mind towards food production in the sea. We accept that nature must be harvested. That's how we make a living on Earth. And uh, so, so we are in general positive towards the idea of producing food in the seas, also agriculture. Uh, if you, th if the environmentalists think that it's going to, if it's going to harm, uh, harm uh, the site, then get on board to show us how we can make it safe. Work with us instead of working against us, and so that we, our communities can move forward. Um, so because you know those that are in favor, uh, we always say it's it's a, it's a sustainable industry, and we want to move on. One of the surprises in our trip to Norway was that uh, in um, looking at how the people work together, and including the environmentalists, something that we don't see in our own country. It's something that's completely different in Canada. Uh, where there's, we're met with more challenges there. But here, it's industry and government and environmentalists working together um, to, to see that the industry moves ahead. Um, because these people here, uh, what they say too is the same, similar to ours. It's, it's going to happen, so why not work together to make it safe? So I was really overwhelmed to see that. At a meeting in Trondheim with Federal Fisheries Minister Jeff Regan and his staff, First Nation representatives from across Canada were given the opportunity to personally discuss specific issues of concern and gather more information on the future of aquaculture in Canada. During the meeting, Minister Regan acknowledged the Aboriginal Aquaculture Association for its groundbreaking efforts to provide reliable and accurate information to First Nations communities. On invitation by Norwegian Minister of Fisheries Sven Ludvigsen, the First Nations delegation also enjoyed a much anticipated seafood luncheon with Norwegian and Canadian government officials and representatives from Norwegian aquaculture companies currently operating in Canada. An international business who have to respect local uh, culture, local history, but they also have to take care of the environment. On the other hand, we have to accept that economically growth is a key factor for developing the rural district. We see home in Norway that those areas and those villages which has not economically growth, and fish farming is such a key factor, the young people leave. We destroy the traditional culture, the traditional backbone of the way of living. During lunch, each of the delegates was given the opportunity to speak about their communities and priorities with respect to aquaculture development. But there is a lot, you know, I've learned quite a bit from the different people that I've talked with in Norway here. And I have a better understanding about Atlantic Sound and what 
I need to do when I go back home. In my traditional territories, we have room for Atlantic Sam. A highlight of the event was the giving of a copper and an Indian name to Minister Ludvigson by the Aboriginal Aquaculture Association and First Nations Thank Chiefs. Thank you very much. I'm honoured and I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm humbled um, to get a gift and the gift which express what you have, have, have said. It's good to have you here. It's um, good to be reminded that somebody came before and somebody was there already when we think we came first. <laughs> <laughs> While in Trondheim, the delegation was able to visit SINTEF, the largest independent research organization in Scandinavia. Interestingly, SINTEF's Fisheries and Aquaculture Division has worked with BC companies in the development of aquaculture technology in the past. Hosted by Jostin Store of their Aquaculture Technology Division, the group enjoyed presentations by senior scientists and researchers on fish husbandry issues and the need for international cooperation in problem solving. With Aquanor now at an end, the delegation split into two distinct groups to embark on several days of touring the many aquaculture-related facilities of coastal Norway. While one group headed north of Trondheim to Snaza, the second group travelled south to Sandusura. In Sindusura, the delegates visited the Aquaforsk Institute of Aquaculture Research, where delegates discussed the requirements of a profitable, competitive aquaculture industry that produces safe and healthy food in a sustainable way. With the group's interest running high, this meeting generated much dialogue. Areas of discussion included selective breeding, nutrition, production management, and product quality. The group then travelled to Christiansen, where delegates had the opportunity to visit the Petro Centre to learn about Norway's offshore oil and gas industry. This industry has many technical and socio-economic parallels with aquaculture. The petroleum and aquaculture industries are the primary economic drivers in coastal Norway. Hosted by Torhild Farstad, delegates were given a brief summary of the development and current state of Norway's oil and gas industry and shared a traditional Norwegian meal with their hosts. Delegates from both groups also had an opportunity to tour a variety of commercial salmon farms as well as research in commercial halibut facilities and commercial shellfish operations involved in mussel culture. I've learned that uh, salmon aren't the only thing that uh, you can look at in the aquaculture industry and get into. Uh, there's different aspects, there's halibut, there's cod, mussels. Uh, you don't hear a lot of that on the west coast happening, uh, but here in Norway they're heavily into all aspects of aquaculture. While Norway is involved in the culture of many species, farm salmon are the driving force of the industry. With tours arranged by Marine Harvest and KF Opdret, the delegation was able to visit several salmon farms at the leading edge of technology. In sharp contrast to Canada, commercial fishing companies are major shareholders in the KF Opdret operation, as is the case with many Norwegian salmon farms. Norway has been the largest producer of farm salmon since its early beginnings in the 1970s, although recent production out of Chile challenges this ranking. With 800 to 850 salmon farm licenses covering 2,400 farm sites, aquaculture is extremely important to coastal communities. With two-thirds of those farms operating at any one time and a similar coastline, population and marine environment to British Columbia, Norway produces ten times the farm salmon produced in BC. Aquaculture is an important activity for the coastal communities of Norway. With the decline of the world fisheries and prior to aquaculture development, Norway experienced many of the same problems of coastal BC in the loss of people from their communities due to lack of employment and opportunity. Today, aquaculture provides much of the employment and economic activity for these communities and has resulted in the development of coastal infrastructure. When asked about his thoughts on this topic, Les Nislaus had this to say. You make an agreement with whoever you're going to be working with and however you're going to do it, you know, move cautiously, be careful, but, but move on and uh, it'll do your community 
well, it'll provide them with the employment that, that's necessary and uh, it'll take away the hopelessness that some of the young people have. That's, I think that's um, one of the things I'd really like to see is that our, our people have the opportunities in the remote areas of, our, of BC with, uh, with being able to provide jobs but not in, uh, not in a way that it would um, harm our environment and our traditional territories. One of the tours was also able to travel to the Institute of Marine Research in Ustaval. Federally funded, the Institute of Marine Research is an agency of the Ministry of Fisheries whose main objective is to provide accurate scientific information to the authorities, industry and the general public. Delegates were given an overview of the Institute's current research in the areas of animal welfare, the environmental effects of aquaculture and the development of marine culture of alternate species. Following his presentation, the group was guided through an extensive tour of the Institute's indoor tank facilities and marine net pen site. One of the areas of research of most interest to the group was the marine culture of new species such as halibut. Here the group was able to observe halibut culture from the larvae stages through early development of juveniles to grow out and maturation. Halibut research conducted at government-sponsored facilities such as Ostaval have provided the knowledge and expertise needed for the production of halibut on a commercial scale, as witnessed by delegates on the second tour at Marine Harvest's Atlantic Halibut Facility near Rurvik. Escorted by Walter Olson, the general manager of this facility, the delegates were able to observe the hatchery production cycle of halibut. While the farming of halibut is similar to salmon, these fish are much more complex in the hatching and nursery stages. Fish grown over several years at this hatchery will be moved to seawater pens at about 2 kilograms in size where they will be grown out to harvest. With production of farmed fish in Norway exceeding 600,000 metric tons in 2004, fish processing facilities are a vital part of the production chain. Knut Udheim from Marine Harvest escorted one group of delegates to a state-of-the-art fish processing facility on the island of Hitra. While small fish processing plants used to dot the coastline, delegates learned that processing plants today are becoming much larger and more integrated. With processing plants becoming more centralized, demand increases for transportation vessels and infrastructure to move the fish to processing facilities. While in the town of Vestness, delegates visited a renowned shipyard operated by the third generation of the Oss family. Olaf Oss gave an excellent presentation to the group about the workings of this facility and the many different types of ships built here. Delegates learned that in addition to tankers and fishing vessels, this company specializes in building live haul well boats for the aquaculture industry. The Orca Warrior seen here is one of two boats built by this company that works the waters of BC's central coast. Following the presentation, the group toured the shipyard where they got a first-hand look at the engineering and technology behind these massive vessels. At the end of the tour, as was customary, Fred Glendale presented Mr. Oss with a token of the group's appreciation. And what we have here is, uh, it's a uh, Authentic, authentic native carving knife to help you in your woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> yes! It's called a bent knife. Yes. yes. A highlight of the many tours throughout Norway was the delegation's visit to Snaza to meet the indigenous people of northern Scandinavia, the Samis. The first stop on this much anticipated visit was at the Sami Museum. Delegates learned about Sami culture and history and shared their common experiences as Aboriginal people. Hosted by Arna Haga, they heard about how reindeer to this day is essential to their existence, providing the Sami with food, clothing, shelter and tools. And now one of the other things that uh, caught my attention while I was here was uh, our visit to the Samis and their uh, similarities as to their predicament as with uh, First Nations in, in British Columbia as well in their, um, for their fight to keep uh, their language alive, their culture alive. And, uh, 
That evening, the group gathered at Sammy House to socialize and share a special meal with their hosts, consisting of a variety of reindeer meat dishes and other traditional Sami delicacies. It was very nice to sit down with uh, the Sami people and talk with them and listen to their stories and find out that there are a lot of similarities between indigenous people no matter where they are in the world. It's raw. So we hope it doesn't matter. While one group was enjoying Sami culture, the second group had an opportunity to experience Norwegian culture of a different kind at a dinner generously hosted by Per Grieg of Grieg Seafoods in Bergen. With operations in Canada, our hosts at Grieg had an opportunity to talk with members of the delegation who well represented their communities as ambassadors. The resulting dialogue was valuable in strengthening relations between Norwegian investors and BC First Nations communities. Once again, reindeer was on the menu of this magnificent three-course dinner which to the guest's surprise was followed by three young graduates of the Grieg Academy of Music at the University of Bergen. At this point, Per Grieg shared his thoughts on doing business with other countries and the importance of understanding and appreciating other cultures. And, uh, and we feel, uh, feel uh, that, that this is how we can make business, understanding what other people do and understanding how we can do this business around the world. Uh, also respecting people's culture and their traditions, uh, which I understand is, is very much uh, a part of the discussion for the First Nations in, in Canada. Uh, After dinner, time was taken for casual conversation, and on behalf of the delegation, Vern Jackson thanked Per Grieg for a wonderful evening. It gives me a great pleasure, yeah. a great honour to be thanking you for the spread that you give us today. It's a wonderful opportunity and I want to say to you on behalf of our CEO, our Executive Director, uh, best of success in your venture and we really hope that you will succeed and I'm sure. As the featured country at Aquinor, the Canadian government hosted a closing dinner with over 250 dignitaries from international aquaculture associations, government and industry. Canadian Minister of Fisheries Jeff Regan was the first to speak. Canada is a great place to be for aquaculture. I've also had the pleasure of meeting with Canada's First Nations delegation whose members are an important and growing part of Canada's diverse aquaculture industry. And I want to thank and congratulate Richard Harry and the AAA, the Aboriginal Aquaculture Association, for their involvement this week. Look, great to have you here, Richard. After a variety of speakers, Vern Jackson of Kitkatla had the honour of delivering an opening prayer before guests dined on an assortment of Canadian yes. seafood specialties. I want to thank the Norwegian government for allowing us to be in your territory. It is always customary to, to thank those who are the host of the country to, for them for allowing us to be here. Throughout dinner, guests took the opportunity to further acquaintances as well as reflect upon their past days in Norway. With dinner coming to an end, Norwegian Fisheries Minister Sven Ludvigsen took an opportunity to address the Canadian delegation. We have had the privilege to be together with the Canadians for a few days. It has been a highlight in the history of agriculture. It's good to see you here together with us tonight. And it's good to see that we have a good dialogue between the industry over the past 12 days, through Aquinor, the meetings, tours, and many hundreds of miles, the delegation enjoyed the hospitality of the people of Norway and learned a great deal about the aquaculture industry. I do come away, you know, I will come away from Norway with a better, better feeling about fish farming. I know I was really, really glad to be invited to Norway, you know, to come and see where it all began. You know. We learned a lot about um, uh, 
the aquaculture industry here in Norway. It was a great experience. Uh, uh, the Norwegian people were very hospitable to us. They looked after all of our needs. And I came as a skeptic to Norway in regard to the aquaculture industry. And uh, Aquanor really answered a lot of questions for me. Many of the delegates came away from Norway with a better understanding of aquaculture and through their observations and experiences here, a positive outlook that aquaculture could exist in harmony with the environment and wild fish resources of the BC coast. I um, hope that when I go back home, I, I can help other people understand uh, the things that we have learned and uh, that there isn't very much to, uh, to worry about re in regards to aquaculture. A lot of the things that I heard, you know, back home or here uh, with the, um, how bad things were in Norway as a result of uh, aquaculture, it isn't true, you know, from all the sources that I, I heard from. The message I would take back to our people on the central coast of British Columbia is uh, that we really have nothing to fear in this, in the aquaculture industry. Uh, the, the information we've received here, uh, I really am confident that, the, that we can move ahead and uh, not have those fears uh, that were there, uh, especially with the First Nations people. First Nations people are environmentalists to begin with. I mean, that's, that's how, how we are. And uh, We still want to survive on, on the wild stock uh, because traditionally that's our own way of, uh, of survival. Uh, that's our regular diet. And we want to see those things to be protected too. And so because uh, I, I survive from it too. I, I, I harvest the wild stock when an opportunity is there. And, I want that protected, but I also want to see us move forward because of the high unemployment rate that we see that is happening. And it's not only just happening in our community, you know, it's all over the place. The group also saw that while Norwegians recognize that there are concerns and problems with any industry, they accept that ocean resources must be utilized and work together to ensure aquaculture is conducted in harmony with other resources industry and the, the government and the environmentalists, they, uh, they all work together. Uh, they work together to a, a common goal, I guess. And uh, that's, that's one thing that we noticed, that, um, that they, they do work together and it makes it so much easier for, for this country. I, I, think, I think the industry is improving through the, through the years. They improve with the mistakes they've made, and they've, they've, uh, the aquaculture industry here in Norway, the companies and the government um, have talked about the mistakes made in the past, and they've, they've tried to correct those. They've moved to correct them. If there is a problem, it's being dealt with, and dealt with properly, which I think is very good, and hopefully we can learn from that and maybe adopt some of their methods or whatever. We know as First Nations that uh, that it um, doesn't matter what you do, you're going to somehow impact the environment. But that's not the, that's not the, uh, the end of it. Uh, if, if we can look past that and, and, uh, and uh, do like the people here are doing, uh, try to minimize the impact. We know there's going to be impacts, but how do we minimize it so that we don't lose that opportunity for our people? Aquaculture can play a major role in the future of coastal British Columbia, and the success of this industry depends largely on the ability of First Nations to take a lead role with government and industry to support its development and sustainability. All I want is the best for my people, you know, into the history. What I do today is, you know, it's for them. You know, it ain't for me. Uh, we have to you know, think about the future, you know, it don't look too good. Our, 
salmon industry is dying, you know, the wild salmon, then look at this year, it's, you know, it, they don't look good anymore. So we have to diverse into something else, you know, into the future. We can't uh, continue to just rely on something that's going to come by and hope for a miracle to happen, eh? but that ain't going to happen. We have to step up to the, to the table and say, this is what we have to do. The um, opportunities that are, that are before us, we need to have a serious look at them. And if they are opportunities to, to create employment for our people, then we should look at it before we say no. We've done the same thing so many times in the past and been left out. <laughs>